So what we're going to do this evening is look at creation and how on earth it happened. And I'm not saying how on earth it happened, I'm saying how on earth it happened. And I don't know whether you've ever thought about this, and I'm sure all of you at some point have spoken to other uh, Christadelphians, other people uh, who believe in the Bible, and who've thought about uh, creation from the Bible point of view. And what I've found is, I don't know whether you've found this, is when you talk to people about creation, there's all sorts of different theories based on the Bible as to how it actually happened. Have you found this when you've spoken to people? There's all sorts of different theories about creation. So um, here's one. So what some people might say is, well, yes, I believe God created the world, but the account in Genesis chapter 1, where it talks about literal days, well, I don't think it's literal days. I think each day could be symbolic of a long time period. So it could be uh, 6,000 years, or it could be 600,000 years, or 6 million years. And I've certainly heard uh, that sort of view expressed, that creation could have been over a very long period period of time. I've also heard people saying, well, um, I think that yes, God created the heavens and the earth, but that was billions of years ago, and actually uh, what happened was uh, about 6,000 years ago, God decided to start the process of creation on this planet. So the earth is billions and billions of years old, and the stars and the sun and the moon are, and, and yet God started creation a fairly short time ago, i.e. 6,000 years ago. I've heard other views expressed, and all these are Christadelphians who are talking to me. Um, some people have said, well, I actually, this is a, a rare review, I must say, uh, God started everything with a big bang, and then sort of put everything in motion, and really evolution took over from there. And there's certainly people who, who've said that to me. Uh, what other views are there? There's, there's, there's other views that actually creation itself is from man's point of view. So, for instance, on the fourth day where it says God made the sun, moon and stars, that he didn't really make them on that day. It was sort of a, the clouds parting. And if there was a man on the earth at that point in time, he would have seen the sun appear in the sky and the moon in the sky as well. And so it goes on. There's so many different views. And uh, I guess it's to some extent, you know, how we view something with what eyes we're looking at something as to exactly what, what we're seeing. But there, there surely can only be one way that God made the heaven and the earth and everything in it. He can't have done it in all those different ways. So the question is, how did God do it? And that's really what we're going to uh, consider tonight. And what we have to do, of course, is suspend what we think, how we might have done it, and purely rely, I believe, on the Scriptures. That's the only basis that we have got, really, to look at from a, uh, you know, what, what God actually did. And yes, when we look at the scriptures, the other thing that we need to do with the scriptures is actually compare scripture to scripture, because it isn't only Genesis 1 that talks about creation. And because God has mentioned throughout the scriptures uh, how he did it, all of those things need to be taken into account. We can't just take isolated things. Everything should work together, and everything should add up and make sense. And the final bit is that there should be evidence in the world around us that what God said he did is true. And I'm not really talking about scientific uh, points of view here, necessarily, because science doesn't always come up with the right answers, as we know. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But the, the, the evidence around us should still back up uh, what God said he did in Genesis chapter 1. I wonder if you'd just have a, a quick look with me, uh, just before we start looking at this, at uh, Hebrews chapter 11, because I think there's a very important verse here in Hebrews 11 that sets the scene for what we're about to think uh, about. Hebrews 
In Hebrews chapter 11, and of course we know this is the faith chapter, and quite often we quote the first verse, which we will look at in just a second. But I want you to have a look at verse 3. Because what this is telling us is that we need to have faith in creation. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed, that were created and formed, by the word of God. Now look at this next phrase here. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So first of all we're told that we've got to have faith that God did it. And of course we've got to have faith because we didn't see him do it. But the interesting thing, and I've put a slightly different translation on the screen here, which sort of says the same thing, but slightly clearer. It says, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. In other words, God created everything from nothing. God created everything from nothing. Now interestingly, when you look at evolution, uh, people who believe in evolution, I say believe because you need faith in that, don't you? Because they weren't there when it all happened. So what they have a real difficulty with, of course, is when you go back far enough in time, you end up with nothing. You actually do end up with nothing. And so the further you go back, right at the very start, there was nothing. And then somehow there was this uh, electric or something, there was some sort of uh, power surge, and there was an explosion, the Big Bang. And out of this bang, Big Bang came every single thing that you can see, the galaxies and the stars and the sun and the moon and the earth and ourselves, ultimately, over time. But the trouble is, and nobody can answer this. When you read the books uh, on, on evolution about this, they can't explain how if you have absolutely nothing, you can get everything. Because actually, it doesn't matter how much you think about that, if there is absolutely nothing, you can't get everything. You can't even get something out of nothing. It's actually impossible. And what God is saying to us here, we have faith. That everything that we see, God didn't sort of look down and think, oh, there's a universe and there's some stars and there's some planets already there, I'll start work on that. He says, no, everything that you see did not exist before I made it. It came from nothing. I built it from nothing. And that really is one of the biggest clues, I think, that there must be a creator, apart from all the design and everything we see, that you can't make something out of nothing unless you are an everlasting, all-powerful God. The other thing is, of course, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, famous verse talking about what faith actually is, and it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. And that word substance, we know, means confidence. So faith is having confidence in what we hope for and in the evidence of the things that we cannot see. That doesn't mean that there is no evidence. It isn't the evidence that's unseen. The unseen thing is God. The unseen thing was creation. The unseen thing is the kingdom. The point is, God has given us evidence about the things that are unseen. So in other words, when we look at the creation accounts, we should be able to see evidence that that actually is right. We should be able to see that evidence. So it is not saying there is no evidence. Faith is having confidence in the evidence. And God has put evidence all around us. Prophecy is just one strand of evidence. Creation is another. The Bible itself is another. These are pillars of God's evidence that we can look at and appreciate him. So I thought what we would do just for a minute is uh, perhaps have a, a look at Genesis chapter 1. Um, this is being read for us, we've got some pictures coming up, but it's read from the authorised version 
and we're just going to look at uh, Genesis chapter 1. So hopefully uh, this will start playing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, Let there be light in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living and moving thing with which the water teems according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. 
they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the air, and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Okay, words that we know very well. So if we come back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, straight away we might have some questions in our mind, because it says there that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and eventually God says, let there be light. And so straight away there would be some who say, well that could have happened billions of years before. And the creation actually started, so day, day one's first act, as it were, was God saying, let there be light. Well, is that true? And what does the rest of the Bible say? Because if that's all we have in front of us, well, it could be true, that could be. There's a, there's a big gap between, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and then him saying, let there be light. The, the difficulty that I have with that is this particular verse and chapter, which is Exodus chapter 20. So come and have a look at Exodus 20. Now bear in mind these inspired words. They are words given, in fact, of course, when the Ten Commandments were given to uh, Moses by the Lord God. So an extremely significant uh, time here. And in Exodus 20 verse 11, Moses, under, under inspiration, said something quite different. He says, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So Moses, if we were setting this as a, as a test for a, you know, a, a group of children at school or something like that, and we said to them, please, to answer this question, will you write down what God, God made in six days? The answer must be the heaven and the earth and all that is in there. All of it, because it says that. The heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So if we were just taking this particular phrase by Moses here in Exodus 20 verse 11, we must conclude that the heaven and the earth were also created within the six days. That's what he believed. And therefore, this now has to tie in to Genesis chapter 1. We might say, well, maybe the earth isn't really the earth. And, maybe, and, and what exactly is the heaven? Well, come back to Genesis chapter 1. And you'll see quite clearly that uh, Moses was quoting uh, from verse 1, where it says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And Moses says, within six days God created the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything uh, within it. Therefore, I think we do have to conclude, if we're going to tie in Exodus 20 verse 11, that actually when God started creation, he started with the heaven and the earth on day one. In other words, if you went back, back one day before the six days, even one second before the six days, there was nothing. The question then is, when it says God created the heaven and the earth. What exactly is the heaven? Well, it can't be the sky, because the sky, which is also referred to as heaven in verse 8, wasn't created until the second day. So it can't be the sky that God created. The heaven is referring to the vast expanse of the universe. There are, in fact, in the Hebrew, three heavens, there is the sky, referred to as the heaven, which was made on day two. There is the heaven, where, which is the vast expanse of space. And the third heaven, which the Apostle Paul actually refers to, is actually where God himself dwells. So there are three heavens in the Hebrew. There is heaven where God actually dwells, which is outside the universe. There is the vast expanse of space, which is a heaven. And there is the sky itself. Well, it can't be the heaven that God was already dwelling in, 
And it can't be the sky, because that wasn't made until day two. The heaven that was made at the start of the first day was the vast expanse of the universe. The question is then, what was in this heaven? <coughs> what was in this heaven? So there is the vast expanse of the universe, and as we know, it's pretty big. God has in effect created a huge, big, black room with nothing in it right now. In fact, there was nothing in it. There were no stars, and there was no sun, and there was no moon. And I'll tell you how we know that, because they weren't made until verse 16. Verse 16 says, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. Now, some might say, well, it says he, he, he made them, but were they already created? But interestingly, you see, you see that word where it says God made? Exactly the same word, made, is used in verse 7 when God says he made the firmament. And it's exactly the same word in verse 25 where it says and God made the beasts of the earth. And it's exactly the same word that God says, let us make man in our image. It's a creative act referred to about beasts, about man, about the sky, and therefore must also refer to the physical creation on the fourth day of sun, moon and stars. And therefore, when God began his creative process on the very second of the first day, the first thing he did was create the vast expanse of the darkness of the universe. The reason he did that, and the reason we have the vast expanse of the darkness of the universe is quite simple, because God has got to hide himself from us during this time of faith that we're living through right now. We could not look upon God and live. So God has created this dark, empty room. But what does he put in it? He puts in it that. The heaven was the vast expanse of the universe. It cannot include sun, moon and stars. And he puts in it a ball of water, the earth. That's all that was in it. You see, what God didn't do was create all the stars and the planets and then look down and think, right, uh, well, which one am I going to have to have my plan and purpose with? That little speck over there will, will, will be fine. No, no, no. God created planet Earth before all of the things and everything else was built around planet Earth. But what's confused a lot of people, and I don't honestly know why, is verse 3 says, God said, let there be light. And people say, well, there you are. The, the sun must have existed for God to say, let there be light. Well, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you if you do think that, because actually, God doesn't need an artificial light bulb like the sun to create light. He just doesn't. If God says, let there be light, do we not think he could create light? And what actually happened was this. God illuminated the whole of the earth with his light. And the whole earth was covered all the way round. There was no shadow, no darkness. The whole of the earth was covered in his supernatural, let's say, light. And here's an amazing thing. We now have the earth on its own, in space, covered in God's light. In Isaiah 45, we read that God tells us the end of the very beginning. And so if we go to the very end, you'll find that he's exactly right. I don't know if you realise that the very last verse in your Bible isn't uh, actually the very last verse in the Bible. The very last verse in your Bible really is Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. That is the, the last verse of the Bible. The, the, the remaining uh, half a uh, dozen or so verses are purely saying, that's it, you've got the message, that's the Bible completed, please don't add any further words to it, may the Lord Jesus Christ come quickly. The very last verse, really, of uh, the scriptures is verse 5 of chapter 22. And the, and the final few verses are just a warning not to add other bits to it. And here, therefore, is the last verse of the Bible. 
Revelation 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, they need no candle, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and shall reign, for, and, and they shall reign for ever and ever. This is a final picture of the, at the end of the, the, the millennium, when the Lord God comes and dwells on earth with man, when the sun is no more need for the sun, moon and stars, and God himself lights the entire earth. In fact, it says it, of course, in the previous chapter, in verse 26, verse 23, it says, The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof, and the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. Isn't it amazing that God shows us the end at the very, very beginning? He lit the world entirely with his glorious light and the last verse says that is exactly what it will be like at the very end. There's one big difference of course and that is at the very end God's light will cover the earth but it will be an earth filled with people reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not get that picture of an earth on its own, with darkness around it, covered in God's light, unless you read it exactly as I've explained it to you. And that, to me, is the only way this fits. Now, there's one other major thing that God did on this first day. You see, if you were stood on the earth, on that first day, actually, you wouldn't know there was a first day. Because, Actually, this earth spinning around, we have no concept, do we, of the earth spinning around apart from the celestial beings in the sky. We have no concept that the earth is spinning around. This earth was spinning around, but if God's light covered the whole thing, you would not know that there was an evening and a morning. And this is why, and we've read it a million times and never perhaps considered it, look what God then does in verse 4. After he has said, let there be light, he then says, and God saw the light and that it was good, now what does he do? He divides the light from the darkness. And I guess in my mind I've always thought, well, that light is always separate from darkness, I mean that's just how it is. But this specifically says that God divided the light from the darkness. There was a division made. Here is what God did. That's exactly what he did. He withdrew half of the light, that his light, away from half of the earth. He divided his light and created darkness. He actually says that in Isaiah, I create light and darkness, good and evil. God actually created half of the earth in darkness. And now, when he was stood on that earth, as it span round, one day would be counted. And that is how the earth looked at the end of day one. There's the verse of Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And brethren and sisters, he did exactly that. What he then did was moved on and actually then created the firmament or sky. So this was now split in two, wasn't it? So we now see on day two that the firmament was made. So in verse 7, we have the firmament being made and this was water being lifted uh, up into the sky. There was in fact, uh, a canopy of water around the earth, probably helping people to live lot, a lot longer uh, before the flood. Because you remember after the flood, the ages dropped down dramatically, and this canopy of water that was in the sky, I mean, bearing in mind it hadn't rained either up until the time of the flood, nobody had ever seen rain, um, there was some difference in the atmosphere than we see right now. But even today, the clouds in the sky are formed by the seas where we see the water going up into the heavens and coming down as rain. So that is what God did on, on that particular day. On day three, he made the dry land 
appear. Uh, and again on day three, there was the grass and the herbs and the fruit trees. Now, one key word, I don't know if you, if you see this, but uh, I'm sure you, you, you do, it keeps talking about things producing themselves after their kind. So in verse 11, we've got uh, the fruit after his kind. Uh, in verse 12, we've got the tree yielding fruit after his kind. Uh, the herb yielding seed after his kind. So God's saying that there were seeds in everything and the seeds would produce themselves again and again after the original one. So whatever you've got here would have a seed in it and it would replicate itself. Well, isn't that exactly what we see? Evolutionists, of course, say completely different. They actually say if you give it enough time, a frog will turn into a prince. That is exactly what they said. Give it enough time, a frog will turn into a prince. Because the frog is down here, and man is up here. We are therefore related to the frog, and give it a few billion years, Mr. Frog will turn into a perfect human being. As far as I'm concerned, that's a fairy story. It is never going to happen. However, many billions of years you throw it, it's a frog seed in itself will only ever produce a frog. It might be a big frog, or a small frog, or a red frog, or a green frog, but when all said and done, it is a frog. The other interesting thing, of course, is that, uh, you're talking about evolution here, but uh, you know, we see these wonderful pictures that they paint of a monkey that over many, many, many millions of stages becomes a human being. And isn't it fascinating that we still have the original monkey and we have the perfect man, but not one single solitary of all the millions of stages that have happened over many, many millions of years in between. Not one. And we've been doing the seminars at Tewkesbury and we, we were going through these things there. And uh, a, a, a guy called Mark, and he must be about 46 or 47, is in the audience, and he came up to me afterwards and he said, I have never, he said, I've always just believed by default the evolution. I was taught it at school, I've never questioned it. And do you know something he said? I've never sat down and thought about why is it that we've still got the monkey, and why have we got the man, and where are all the bits in between? And not only all the bits in between the monkey and the man, but between the fox and the horse. Because don't forget, of course, that your horse that you see galloping around, your evolutionary book tells you, came from a fox. And my children who are, who are into horses just burst out laughing. Apparently, in the, in the school class when they did this, only about a month or two ago, the whole class couldn't stop laughing. And of course, it gets even more ridiculous if we wanted to get into it with, the, with, with something like the whale, which of course evolution, the book actually, you know, certain books where, which go into some detail on it, will tell you that the whale was once a fish that crawled out and became a mammal and grew legs and wandered around the place and then decided to go back into the sea, lose its legs, and now it's, and now it's a whale. It's just, it is an incredible. Uh, you know, what, what they'll come out with. What God said in simple terms, but true terms, is that everything has a seed within itself that will replicate the seed, uh, replicate itself. And I don't, say, I don't care what you look at, that is absolutely the evidence that we see. That things replicate themselves, and yes, there are slight differences, but no species has ever become another species to anybody's own sight. Nobody has seen that happen. What we have seen is what God says. So now we come to this one, which is the sun, moon and stars. So on day four, we're now reading about the sun, moon and stars. Now this is quite interesting when you stop and think about this, because if God is right when he says, and I believe he is, that he made those things on that day, we're only four days or three days into creation, and there has been no sun up until this point. There can't have been any sun because he made it on this day, just as he made the creatures on the, on the sixth day, and he made uh, the firmament on, on the second day. These things did not exist before the fourth day. So what was lighting the world up until this point? 
why it was God's glory. It was God's light that for that first three, four days was lighting the world. And at this point, when the sun was created, his glory, his light, was withdrawn. And you realise, brethren and sisters, that this mirrors absolutely accurately history. Because as we know, the first six days of creation do mirror uh, the whole of human uh, history that was to follow. And interestingly, just a few hundred years before the Lord Jesus Christ was born, God withdrew his glory from the temple. It was God's glory. God had spoken to man for all this time. He had shown them signs and wonders for all this time. He even dwelt between the cherubim in the temple during these first thousands of years. But when the Lord Jesus Christ came, just a few hundred years before he was born, God, it says in Ezekiel, drew his glory from the earth. That's exactly what happened in creation. He withdrew his light. Why? Because now the light of the world was born. The light of the world was born on this day, on the fourth day. And the Lord Jesus Christ was born on that day, the light of the world. And God's glory just a few hundred years before, but still on exactly this same clock, uh, departed from the temple. So we think, therefore, that God has put the sun and the moon and the stars in place exactly at the right time. The moon, of course, is symbolic of the ecclesia. And the ecclesia was born at exactly that same time. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, there was, there was no real ecclesias as we see them now, were there, in the Old Testament. We know that there was a nation that followed those principles, but the ecclesia was not born. The moon is symbolic of the ecclesia because what the moon does is reflect the light of the Lord Jesus Christ into the darkness of the world. So the moon was made at the same time as the sun was made, which was on the fourth day, which ties in exactly uh, with what we expect to see uh, from history. God then makes the, uh, the living creatures in the sea. He makes the fowls of the, uh, of the air on the fifth day as well. And on the sixth day, he made the beasts of the earth and he made man and woman. I just want to show you this, because I think this sort of confirms what, we, what we're saying here, that all things were made in these six days. So, if you look at the first um, three days of creation, on the first day, what I'm suggesting is, on the very first day, God created heaven, which was the vast expanse of the universe. Nothing in it apart from planet Earth which he made also on the first day, according to Moses. On the second day, God created the atmosphere. He created the firmament. On the third day, God created dry land by bringing the land out of the waters. So on those first three days, God is creating these things. And on the next three days, look what he does. So on day four, what does he do? He fills what he has made on the corresponding day. So on the first day, he created the vast expanse of the universe, and on the fourth day, he filled it. He filled it with the sun and with the moon and with the stars. On, the, on day five, what does he do? He fills the things that he's made, and he separated water from water, so we've got water here, and we've got water up in the sky, and what does God fill it with? The fish and the birds. On the third day, God created the dry land, and on the sixth day, the corresponding day, what does God do but fill it with animals and man? So if it was... And, and, and lots of Christophian books say this, that on day one, all God made on day one was light, and the heavens and the earth pre-existed billions of years before. It doesn't work. 
Because all that you've got then is light, and God filled, filled it with what? The sun, moon, and stars. Well, again, uh, many people are, are saying in some Christian books, well, the sun, moon, and stars pre existed, and actually, through the watery vapors of the clouds as they parted, suddenly you, you, you saw the sun. That is not what it says. And if you want to say that, well, you may as well say, well, God didn't make the animals either on the sixth, on the sixth day. He didn't actually make the atmosphere on the second day. Because it's the same word being used for that, for that, and for that. God made these. We might say to ourselves, were they real days? Were this creation over six literal days? Well, of course it was. How else would this great machine work together? Imagine, if you would, that these were huge epochs of time. I don't, you don't even have to make them huge epochs of time. Let's say they were a thousand years each. So, on day three, we've got the dry land and uh, we've got the seas and so on. But basically, then on day three, we're waiting for a thousand years for the sun to be actually doing its photosynthesis through the leaves uh, and, and so on. Um, you've got to actually make this happen very, very quickly. The fish and the birds and the land animals, we know how integrated they are together. You couldn't have thousands of years waiting for the bee to come that the flower that was designed for it over here can't survive without that bee. So thousands of years ago, I'm going to wait for this bee to come and do the right job. The design was done by God over I do not know how long. But once it was designed, it was manufactured together quickly. And it makes more sense. I tell you what, I would struggle more if it actually said, uh, these are periods of time of a million years each. Or a thousand years each. Because then, somebody could quite rightly say, well that doesn't make sense, because how could that survive without that when we can see that they're designed for each other? And how could this survive without that when those things are so intimately connected? The point is, it had to be put together quickly. And some have said to me, well, that plant, yes, I can see is designed for that creature, no doubt about it, but maybe God uh, sort of just help that plant along without the thing he was going to create in a thousand years' time. But why would he do that? When the things are designed together, surely the whole system had to be put into place and put into place very, very quickly. The other bit of evidence, of course, for creation is quite simply the fact that we are running on a week. Even now we run on a week. And do you know something? There isn't a nation, well, I tell a lie, I was going to say, there isn't a nation on earth that doesn't run on a week. There are two nations out of the 157 nations on planet earth that don't run on a week, but 155 of them do. All this planet, and these are two little islands somewhere, so with a few hundred people on, so 99.99999% of this planet runs on a week. Now you tell me where a week comes from. Because it doesn't come from anywhere other than creation. Nowhere. The moon governs the months. The year is governed by the, the planet going around the sun. The day is governed by the earth spinning around. Where does the week come from? It comes from nowhere else but creation. And from the day that it started, this week, I mean, everybody's lives revolve around a week. We think, when's the weekend? When's the weekend? It's Monday, I'm going to work. Our lives are patterned on a week. God's life was patterned on a week when he created it and the world has continued in that vein. Which was the day that he rested? It was a Saturday. We know it was a Saturday because it was a Sabbath. And every single seven days have been counted from there until now. And so a Sabbath today is a weekly anniversary of the Sabbath back then. Do you know something else remarkable? That means the first day was a Sunday. And on the Sunday, God created the light and the world. It just so happens that every Sunday is a weekly anniversary of when God did, did that, when God created the light and the world. Every Sunday is that anniversary. 
And what do we do every Sunday? We remember the light of the world. Because we remember the Lord Jesus Christ who said he was the light of the world. And so it's, it's absolutely fitting that every Sunday, that is the day when, when we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. The first day of the new week. And so creation, how on earth did it happen? If we want to fit together what God said happened, and especially if we want to take into account Exodus 20 verse 11 that says, In six days the Lord God made the heaven and the earth and everything in it, the only possible explanation is that on that first day, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, it was on the first day. And all the other things that he made fitted into that pattern on absolute 24 hour clocks as we now know. The scientists, of course, will tell you something different. They'll say that the light we've been on the news only a few days ago, that the light from the stars has taken billions of years to get to us. It's nonsense, you know. And the reason it's nonsense is this. If we put a scientist in the Garden of Eden only a few hours after God had made it, everything, and we showed him Adam, Adam wasn't the tiny little thing on the floor, was he? He was a man. The scientist would tell you categorically that that man was 30 years old. I can prove to you he's 30 years old because I know what a man looks like after that length of time. And we would turn around and say, you know what, he's not. He's less than, a, a, less than a day old. The scientists would look at the tree growing next to Adam, this tree covered in fruit, because the fruit was already bearing on the branches when God made it. And there, the scientists would tell you, well, I'm telling you now, look at the rings on that tree. That tree is a hundred years old. And yet, Mr. Scientist, you are wrong. That tree is less than three days old. The light from the sun and the light from the stars, says Mr. Scientist, has taken billions of years to travel here and therefore must be billions of years old because I can see it and the light has taken that time to get here. Again, he is wrong because God created the light from the stars instantly seen here on earth. There is actually evidence to suggest that light has slowed down over time and when God began everything, light was infinitely fast and over time has slowed down, but that's another story. Whether that is true or not, what I can tell you is that God made everything very good, all working, all up and running, and therefore, when we hear about uh, you know, stars taking billions of years for the light to reach us, actually it isn't true. It was being seen instantly, and therefore, all things were put together. So, I don't know if that was uh, helpful or not, but to me, it wraps the whole of the scriptures together and helps us understand those early verses, but ultimately helps us understand the final plan and purpose of God, which is to fill this earth with his glory, with his light, as the waters cover the seas, which is exactly how it all began. <laughs>